The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Reasonably Speaking. Today, our panelists are going to discuss the recent Supreme Court case, Liu v. Securities Exchange Commission, as well as the history of the law and the court cases on remedies that led to this decision and its potential future implications. Our first panelist today is Andrew Cull. Andrew is a distinguished senior lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Andrew is one of the nation's leading experts in the area of restitution and is also a well-known constitutional historian. He served as reporter on the American Law Institute's Restatement of the Law III, Restitution and Unjust Enrichment. Our second panelist is Caprice Roberts. Caprice is a visiting professor of law at the George Washington University Law School. Throughout her academic career, Caprice has devoted scholarly attention to proper judicial role and the advancement of the law of remedies. She recently completed the new edition of the seminal treatise Dobbs and Roberts' Law of Remedies, and has published the ninth edition of a leading remedies casebook with Doug Rendleman, as well as a co-authored casebook in federal courts. Finally, the moderator for today's episode is Douglas Laycock. Doug is perhaps the nation's leading authority on the law of religious liberty and also on the law of remedies, having taught and written on these topics for four decades. Currently, at both the University of Virginia School of Law and the University of Texas School of Law, he has testified frequently before Congress and has argued many cases in the courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, where he has served as lead counsel in six cases. He is the author of the leading casebook, Modern American Remedies, and the award-winning monograph, The Death of the Irreparable Injury Rule. Doug recently took emeritus status on the American Law Institute's counsel in order to serve as reporter on the Restatement Fourth of Torts, Remedies. Doug and Caprice, among others, filed an amicus brief in Liu v. SEC, which heavily cited the Restatement Third of Restitution and Unjust Enrichment. I will now turn over the microphone to Doug. Well, hello, I'm Douglas Laycock at the University of Virginia. I have with me Caprice Roberts from George Washington University and Andrew Cull from the University of Texas. And we're talking today about a series of Supreme Court cases that have given a lot of attention to remedies that do not award the plaintiff's damages, they award the defendant's profits. It was a major decision this year in Liu versus the Exchange Commission. Um, Caprice and I and some other scholars filed an amicus brief in that case. Uh, It heavily cited the restatement third of restitution and unjust enrichment. Andrew was the reporter for that. Um, They've granted two Federal Trade Commission cases that have been held for Liu. So there's a lot going on at the court and it did not just begin uh, this year. Um, six years ago in Petrella versus MGM, um, they uh, uh, upheld a, a remedy that awarded MGM's trademark inf- or copyright infringement profits to uh, the copyright holder. Um, and they said in that case that although these, these remedies have roots both in common law and in equity, we're going to treat them as equitable. So these are restitutionary remedies, which the court treats as derived from equity, as they heavily were. They were called quasi-contract at law. They were called accounting for profits and equity. And more recently, they are often called uh, disgorgement. In 2015, in Kansas versus Nebraska, uh, they awarded a profits remedy for breach of contract against Nebraska. This was about dividing the water from the Republican River. And the part of the river in Nebraska is a lot further west than the part of the river in Kansas. So it's more arid and the water is more valuable there. And Nebraska's profits from taking more than its share were greater than Kansas's damage from not getting all of its share. Um, So that's a bit of background leading up to Liu. Uh, There have been some other cases that uh, that Caprice and Andrew will will talk about. Individual victims of securities fraud uh, can sue for their damages or they can sue for the fraudster's wrongful profits. Uh, More commonly, the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, sues for the fraudster's wrongful profits. And that brings us to Liu. Uh, 
The Securities and Exchange Act authorizes the SEC to sue for, and I'm quoting now, any equitable relief that may be appropriate or necessary for the benefit of investors. That includes recovery of the profits of securities fraud because recovering the bad guy's profits is a form of equitable relief. And the SEC persuaded lower courts over the years to award judgment against each defendant for the gross receipts of all the defendants. So profits got defined as gross receipts and it was joint and several liability. And three years ago in a case called Kokesh versus the SEC, Supreme Court said that's a penalty. You're awarding more than the actual profits of any one defendant. Um, that makes it a penalty. That makes it subject to a five-year statute of limitations on government actions to recover and government actions to recover penalties. So in Kokesh v. SEC, the Supreme Court said that's a penalty. It's subject to the five-year statute of limitations on actions to recover penalties. And that set up Liu. The defendants in Liu argued equity doesn't award penalties. Kokesh said it's a penalty. And that means it's not equitable relief. And the relevant statutory provision here authorizes equitable relief. There are other provisions for penalties, but they weren't followed here and they weren't invoked here. Uh, so you can't get disgorgement from us anymore after Kokesh. The SEC said, look, equity is very flexible. It can evolve. It can include whatever we want it to include, and it can include disgorgement of gross receipts, and that's still equitable. Uh, Reese and I and a few others filed an amicus brief in support of neither side, and we started out by saying both sides are clearly wrong. Uh, disgorgement is just another name for accounting for profits. Accounting for profits has a long history in the Supreme Court. It has a clearly defined measure of recovery. There are subtle rules here. You can read them in the restatement. Uh, courts don't just make it up as they go along. Uh, this, the disgorgement remedy is for the net profits of each defendant, not gross receipts not joint and several liability, but the net profits of each defendant. And we cited a long line of intellectual property cases in the Supreme Court going far back into the 19th century before intellectual property law was codified. We cited Justice Story's treatise on equity. Um, and of course, we cited the restatement. The Supreme Court agreed, eight to Thomas. Uh, it did not cite our brief, but it cited most of the intellectual property cases that we had cited and it repeatedly cited uh, Andrew's restatement. Uh, so the SEC can still get disgorgement after Kokesh. Uh, it's equitable, it is limited in net profits, there's no joint and several liability, and a point we had not made, the SEC must distribute the money to defrauded investors if possible. Um, Andrew Caprice, anything to add on Liu itself before we talk on how we got there? Uh, let me try to give my version of a brief history. I do want to, I want to keep it brief, but I want to start one step back with your indulgence. I think the story starts with a New York case, Falk versus Hoffman in 1922. It's a Cardozo opinion, very simple kind of fraudulent inducement. Uh, somebody fraudulently induced to sell his securities to the bad guys. The uh, private plaintiff or plaintiffs came into New York court and said they wanted the securities and the proceeds of the ones that had been sold held for them in constructive trust. So that's an interesting feature that the things were identifiable. It was a constructive trust case. The idea that uh, you could have constructive trust relief against a non-fiduciary bad guy has been a very important feature of American restitution law, I would say, since Newton versus Porter, 1870s. So, so far, so good. Falk versus Hoffman, as far as I know, the first example of securities fraud restitution along these lines. Again, private action, Cardozo, so it has one of his great lines. This is the case where Cardozo is, says, equity will not be over nice where action may baffle and inaction may confirm the purpose of the wrongdoer. And that's not just so characteristic of him, but when you've been looking at these securities cases, I think it's amazingly the same without the rhetorical um, sheen 
to what the Second Circuit is saying 50 years later in um, SEC versus Texas Gulf, Gulf Sulphur, where uh, Judge Waterman, I think it was, said it would severely defeat the purpose of the Act, Exchange Act, if we couldn't do this. I mean, the thinking is the same. However, Falk versus Hoffman, 1922. Now the statutes. In 1934, the Securities Exchange Act. As people, when I went to law school, everyone had to take securities law. I don't think they do anymore. Uh, but if you remember anything, you probably remember the, the Exchange Act, the 1934 Act, um, didn't forbid very much along these lines. It says you may not have a manipulative or deceptive device or contrivance. They didn't even say fraud. That was left to the commission when they put out their rules, I guess a year or two later, and they wrote the famous Rule 10b-5, which says that a scheme to defraud is illegal and making an untrue material statement or failure to make a statement you should have made is uh, illegal. On the remedies side, uh, the SEC, well, there was no private right of action at all. The SEC had the right to investigate and seek an injunction. And finally, towards the end, it said the federal district courts have jurisdiction of all suits in equity and actions in, at law. Now, the point of this ancient history is just to to say that in this particular area, remedies for security fraud, the whole course of our law has been uh, so notably incremental. And uh, with the agency and the courts kind of making their way with an idea of what needs to be done most of the time, Congress playing catch up, uh, not very, well, they're doing the best they can, but that pattern has continued. So anyway, we have Rule 10b-5. It was very quickly found uh, that the bare jurisdictional grant, just saying that district courts have jurisdiction of suits in equity, meant that they could not only give injunctions in a proper case, but uh, apply remedies that were ancillary to injunctions. And I think the first thing that was decided is they could uh, appoint receivers. And I think it's also the case, Doug, you know this history better than I do, that the very same kind of uh, evolution was happening with other statutes, equity, equity jurisdiction in other statutes. It was not simply a matter of the securities law being special. Okay, so things sit there for a while. Uh, federal district courts decided in the late 40s, early 50s, that a private right of action under the securities laws was implied. So, okay, so far as I know, the first really memorable um, attempt to bring a, an action for recovering the, you know, the ill-gotten gains of securities fraud was a private action uh, brought under the implied right of action from Rule 10b-5. In, uh, in a case called Janigan versus Taylor, 1965, in the uh, first, in, well, the appeal is in the First Circuit. Um, there was no tracing. There was no constructive trust. Uh, they did show the profits uh, and the causation between the uh, fraudulent misrepresentations. And the First Circuit said in 1965, it's simple equity that the wrongdoer should disgorge, he used, he used the word disgorge, should disgorge his fraudulent enrichment. At least they said enrichment. And the citations for this were Falk versus Hoffman, Cardozo, also restatement of restitution from 1937, uh, Scott on Trust's relevant sections, which is his uh, gloss on the restatement of restitution, which he had written. So that's 1965. So far as I'm aware, the first time the SEC ever tries this is the case of SEC versus Texas Gulf Sulphur, 
uh, and the opinion in the Second Circuit in 1971. It was an insider trading case. The court refers to restitution, they're calling it at this point. They say it is fine as an ancillary remedy to the injunction. So long as it is remedial and not a penalty, right? I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, although we forget things. So when it is first introduced, they're saying this is fine because it is remedial and not a penalty. Uh, the SEC was only asking uh, the uh, defendants to restore what had been profits as the direct result of the misrepresentation. There was some timing that made that fairly easy to distinguish. And they had a pretty careful system set up that all of the profits would be paid into an escrow, which would be held for five years to uh, pay the claims of defrauded investors. So, so you know, to the extent they could be found. And at the end of five years, anything that had not been claimed by investors would be paid to the company, Texas Gulf Sulphur, which I believe is standard thinking about insider trading cases. They said the investors have a higher equity than the customer, but uh, than the corporation, I'm sorry, but both the investors and the corporation are entitled to these profits ahead of the, um, ahead of the bad um, officers and directors. So I draw a little line mentally at Texas Gulf Sulphur, it's 1971, and Janigan versus Taylor, I would say, for purposes of just our ALI orientation, at this point, the law of restitution for securities fraud is 100% in accordance with the thinking of restitution third, restatement restitution on just enrichment. Uh, what happened? How did we go off the track? Uh, there were a number of circuit court decisions, I believe a lot of them, I think mostly in the 1990s and 2000s, as very conveniently recounted in the Kokesh decision three years ago, that showed that the SEC was just becoming more aggressive, more kind of self-aggrandizing in its attitude toward what it was calling disgorgement. There was no Netting, I mean, no attempt to decide what are the legitimate expenses so that we really are not awarding more than profits. They would ask for gross receipts. No attempt necessarily to make any sort of restitution to injured investors. No attempt to justify what they were doing in terms of unjust enrichment. On the contrary, they aggressively defended what they were doing, both in court and in Congress, as an appropriate remedy for what they said is, after all, it's an offense against the laws of the United States. We're not worried especially about a fraud on investors. And the point here is deterrence and not compensation. This was their, this was their avowed position. So naturally, they are setting themselves up eventually for the reaction they get in coke cash which is what you are doing here is applying a penalty, it's punitive, and so the statute of limitations kicks in. I will say finally, meanwhile, the Congress continuing its, you know, kind of, <laughs> its attempts to bring some order here. In 1990, they, they amended the statute so that they say the SEC can uh, seek equitable remedies in a civil action, you know, it no longer, you no longer had to say, well, it's implicit because it's ancillary to an injunction. I think in 1990, uh, people knew what equitable remedies uh, were to this extent. They knew they included this one. And then 10 years later, in another statute, they finally used the word disgorgement, saying that in administrative proceeding, as opposed to civil action, they could seek disgorgement. Uh, now, final thing, how did all of this happen? Here, this is just my hypothesis. I, I'm guessing. Uh, I would say, educated guess. I would say first, the SEC sees themselves on the side of the angels. They are 
interested in catching bad guys, not particularly in equity or unjust enrichment. This version of disgorgement is the line of least resistance for them so long as the courts will let them do it. Uh, I would guess, well, I, I will say, I think I'm sure about this, it is impossible to imagine that we could have this same development without the gradual weakening professional grasp of this whole area of the law. I mean, the part that we talk about in the restatement of restitution and unjust enrichment, uh, everything that goes by the name equity, so far as that's relevant to these questions. I won't start in on an impromptu speech about it here, but that, that can't be news and it can't be controversial. For complicated reasons, these things are not, uh, not as visible to lawyers and judges as they were, say, back around 1971, time of Texas Gulf Sulphur. And I would say, finally, everyone who's ever tried to say anything about restitution knows how bad the terminology is here. It is just so harmful and in so many ways produces confusion and people talking past each other and so forth. Nowhere are the terminology problems in this area worse than they are here with this word disgorgement. Now, we use it uh, in the restatement. I would say as long as everyone understands, as we did, that when we say this, it means surrender of unjust enrichment and that this has become uh, common usage uh, for uh, that form of a restitution remedy. No harm, no, no harm done, I hope. But the word itself, the SEC had no trouble whatsoever using this word uh in a as a in a way that described a penalty um i would guess this is a guess that somewhere within the uh, scc there is a sort of in-house practice book that tells how uh you know claims are to be formulated and i bet you anything that at some point they began telling the staff to use the word disgorgement I think probably they liked it because it has a dramatic sound to it uh, once the courts began to accept it. Um, the name makes a difference. I would say as a just concluding thought experiment, if somehow by some power the SEC lawyers had been obliged to give this remedy exclusively in all of their pleadings and briefs and arguments exclusively referred to it as something like equitable restitution. Just suppose they'd had to call it that. Uh, it is impossible to imagine this same development and it is impossible to imagine the, road, the, the decisions in Kokesh or Liu, you couldn't do it. Anyway, I've said too much, but there's my um, historical survey. Justice Thomas seemed to think that disgorgement is not just a new name for accounting for profits. It's a completely different remedy. Uh, it's recently made up. It's not equitable. It has no basis in history in the statute, and, and it shouldn't be available. The court should repudiate it. That didn't happen. Uh, the majority was not as explicit as it could have been, but I think they treated disgorgement as just a new name for uh, accounting for profits, and accounting for profits remedies go back a very, a very long time. Um, so, Caprice, what can we predict about how Liu is going to be implemented? What happens next and going forward? Sure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss uh, this issue further. Uh, just as uh, Andrea was mentioning about the basically the conundrum that's raised by all the labels and the, you know, sometimes severe lack of knowledge about this topic, it, it creates somewhat of a perfect storm that on the back of the wind that's coming from the SEC having taken all of these, uh, as has been described as aggressive maneuvers, um, and in using uh, what of course is to their advantage to talk about uh, seeking gross profits or seeking joint and several liability, among other things. And, and that led to the Kokesh opinion, uh, which in some ways we could describe as not really moored to restitution in the same way, but we, we can we can get to that in, in a minute. But uh, in terms of like what's coming out of the Liu opinion, I think 
what's nice is even though we're in the midst of this perfect storm, we're seeing the, the Supreme Court having new interest increasingly in hearing more and more of these cases and maybe trying to uh, perhaps reconcile and make more sense of the doctrines of unjust enrichment and, and retying the remedy of, of profits to that. Uh, to the principles of unjust enrichment and to the principles of equity. Of course, when it uses the idea of principles of equity, part of the problem is, uh, is the court really talking about one identifiable set of principles? Uh, Sam Bray has talked about perhaps it's creating a usable equity versus being accurate all the time. And then the Supreme Court has to deal with its own uh, befuddlement in prior cases where perhaps it's used incorrect labels, incorrect decisions between law and equity, and it may well find itself in that position again with having to do some cleanup on aisle five over the Kokesh opinion uh, after the Liu opinion. But in terms of what Liu, the, the heart of it again ties back to this idea of a simple equity and that case uh, that that Andrew quoted from, which is the Janigan versus Taylor, which is a private uh, securities an implied private right of action under securities law that was in 1965. And in that case, uh, the First Circuit talked about uh, tying, uh, you know, making sure that the wrongdoer should disgorge their unjust or fraudulent enrichment in that case. Uh, and in fact, that the defrauded party should get the, the, the benefit of any windfall if there were any, but at the same time that there are limits on this disgorgement of unjust enrichment. But the court didn't go uh, too far down the road. It's a very short opinion. It talked a little bit about uh, an example of a limit uh, and they use sort of an art example. Uh, you know, if an artist acquires a painting by fraud, uh, they're not suggesting the defrauded party would be entitled to the portrait, for example, or even the proceeds of the sale. And they basically say that that example of a limit isn't applicable to the given case because the case was about uh, the conveyance of uh, property to a fraudulent party. And so- said, if, if I'm gonna interrupt, I think they said, if, sure. the, if, the, if the artist acquires the paints in the canvas by fraud or theft and yes. then creates the Mona Lisa, the hardware store doesn't get the Mona Lisa. Yeah, sorry, uh, exactly, exactly right. So they're trying to distinguish that from what was actually going on in the case at hand. Um, so, so they end up not not using that, but saying instead that, it, that all of the uh, wrongful profits should be discord and that that is uh, wedded to this simple equity, again, but simple equity having some limits. And I think what the Supreme Court is attempting to do in the Liao opinion is to clarify what sort of, first of all, that, that this disgorgement or the word disgorgement and the, and the stripping of profits is uh, a remedy that is available under equitable remedies and that um, but with that it is sometimes the court calls it constricted uh, constricted or limitations from uh, equitable principles that those have to be in force and then uh, the opinion uh, what goes on to give examples of how those limits will apply uh, doesn't resolve them so that's one important thing to remember uh, Again and again, the court will say they're trying to answer something that was left open, explicitly left open by the Kokesh case, but at the same time, they're not running it all the way to ground because they are um, saying that on remand, we're, we're confident the lower courts can uh, make these final determinations. And the big one is who should get the money. And of course, as already has been mentioned, the SEC in many of these cases was attempting to keep all the money in, in the government uh, treasury as opposed to going and finding the victims of the fraud in the first place and making sure that they uh, get these funds that are taken and stripped from the defendant. So on that question of, of who gets the money, the court said, well, there is a parameter to that. And the parameter is going back to, to the statute itself and the benefit of the investors, that that's the whole purpose of it. Uh, but the court did open a door to the government's argument saying, well, we would like to talk about what if it's not feasible for us to find these investors. And the court said, well, again, the district court is, is perfectly capable of uh, hearing that argument, entertaining it, but that doesn't mean you don't have to, to try to do that, that, that you don't have to try to give uh, the monies that you are taking from the defendant. So it, it doesn't just get to be sort of a government uh, windfall, that there is some import to the idea of um, the government wanted to argue it's simply a matter of that the disgorgement type of remedy lets 
that it should end with the discussion of get the profits from the wrongdoer and the court shouldn't be involved in anything after that and the government didn't have a responsibility to get the money back to investors. But here, I think importantly, the Luau case uh, establishes that yes, the government does have that responsibility and, and that there is in order to keep with unjust enrichment principles and equitable limitations that there is this tie to getting it back to the investors. And again, they can argue on remand or, or before district court or magistrates about exactly uh, whether they're capable and, and, and feasible to find and actually get the money to those investors. Uh, another big point, and, and Andrew mentioned this as well, which is the, the proper deductions that should be made and how to get to net profit as opposed to gross. And again, SEC had you know every reason to want to go ahead and you ask for growth, start with that, and finish with that. But the court did a nice job, I think, clarifying, and, and we argued in, uh, I, I signed on to the amic amicus brief that um, Doug was the author of, we argued that net is appropriate with unjust enrichment and not gross. And that keeps with everything that's in the restatement third of restitution and unjust enrichment. And then the question is, well, what, what can you deduct? And in, in keeping with the restatement, uh, the court clarifies that it should be sort of, uh, you know, necessary and uh, to a legitimate expense and goes on to describe legitimate business expenses, even gives, the court says it doesn't need to give further guidance, which Justice Thomas in the dissent says, yes, you do. But the majority says, we don't really need to give guidance, but we'll give you an example. Uh, and they talk about, even in the, in, in the case at Barr, that there were perhaps some lease payments, and they talk about cancer treatment equipment, that perhaps, but it doesn't resolve it. Again, it basically says on remand, lower court's perfectly capable of figuring out <clears throat> and hearing the claims. And of course, keep in mind, the burden would be on um, the defrauder there to, to try to deduct, make an argument for deducting those uh, business expenses that are legitimate from, from the larger amount, from the gross receipts, uh, in order to get down to a net profits number. Uh, they had argued below about the exception of what if the whole thing is fraught with, uh, you know, an, an, an unlawful or wrongful, uh, and, it, and it's all being used for that. And that's something uh, that the district court listened to quite closely and, and tried to go that direction. And that's why they didn't have the deduction. But here the court is saying, no, you need to do this evaluation of what are in fact legitimate business expenses and, and try to uh, hear those arguments and make the analysis in, in more of a way than the court did. Uh, another question that I think will come up out of the case is um, the other, a, a third traditional limit on unjust enrichment and, and, and equitable principles is, you know, how far can the profits go before they become too remote? And there are other uh, cases, like Donald, I think that, that talk about that. Um, but at any rate, the, the, uh, that's something that would also be a traditional limit that could be talked about on remand. And then I think the last couple of items I wanted to discuss were just what are some other questions coming out of the case. Uh, and one is already mentioned by Andrew Cole on the irreconcilability of Kokesh. Uh, and I think that's true because Kokesh you know, talks about penalty and that's why you have the, the argument coming forward in Liao that that's, if it's a penalty, then it's not allowed here. Uh, of course, that the court instead views the profits remedy as being restitutionary and being equitable uh, and fitting within that history of equity. But now does that reopen what Koch has decided with whether or not the SEC should have the power to ever go after on the penalty side and use that statute of limitations? And I think as Doug mentioned, uh, that's not yet resolved, but you can bet that that will be litigated. Um, last point was just that the idea of joint and several liability, we had argued in the amicus brief that uh, the history shows that there is not joint and several and, and should not be, that instead each individual wrongdoer should have to disgorge their net profits as attributed to them, but not collectively or joint and severally. Uh, the court though, and, and the majority opinion in, in, in Liao, opens the door to a type of joint and several uh, determination being made by the lower court and looking for, you know, are, do you have partners that are in concert? And again, not really clarifying what it means by that. Uh, we argued in the amicus brief that it shouldn't be a practical partnership, 
you know, if you, if you don't have a real partnership, basically, then, then you shouldn't be able to go that route. And we would continue to maintain that the court should not allow uh, the joint and several because again, all of this, all of these limitations are to try to make sure that all we are doing with a profit space remedy is uh, disgorging what is the unjust enrichment and not penalizing, punishing, or having anything punitive going on. The partnership issue was a little odd in Liu because the defendants were husband and wife. And so they had commingled finances, presumably, even if they weren't legally partners. Um, Andrew, did you have anything to add on the joint and several point? Yes, I think this may be one point at which my I am more curious about this than I think uh, my friends Doug and Caprice are. Uh, when we talked about it, it occurred to me that I don't think the restatement says anything about this. I don't think we ever thought about it. I would be inclined to say it's not because there are no instances. I mean, I would, you know, why might there be joint and several liability in a securities fraud case? I would, if I were trying to argue it, I, I'd say, well, um, if we said these people, the the the, the Defendants have have both been lying uh, to the uh, claimant. We could sue them for tort and deceit. They'd be joint tort feasors. What's the difference? If they are fiduciaries, if they're co-trustees, there's nothing to say. But I think also by at least the second restatement of trust and a lot of case law, if you have somebody who is not strictly a co-trustee, but is nevertheless uh, participating in the breach of trust, uh, he's li there's joint and several liability there. In any situation like uh, Falk versus Hoffman, where uh, constructive trust is possible, uh, there will in effect be a joint and several liability. In effect, although you wouldn't use that name. And uh, finally, when I was reading, I guess it was the uh, Liu case, uh, I learned, I was not aware that there had been so many circuit court of appeals decisions in the last 20 years that seemed to have devoted quite a lot of attention to this. Uh, there's one, I think it's called Whittemore, something like that, Judge Rogers. There's quite an extensive discussion about uh, the different things the courts have said about it. And she says, well, some people say there has to be either a close relationship or a uh, collaboration in the fraud. And the question is, is it a, there has to be both of these or is it an and or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so when Caprice says this uh, remains to be determined, yeah, absolutely. But I, I'm thinking, I'm not sure that on unjust enrichment principles, we would uh, reject it out of hand. Uh, a husband and wife, assets commingled, they seem to have been collaborating, I mean like hand in glove on manipulating the fraudulent scheme. Uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, inappropriate. Yeah, the starting point is different. Joint tort feasors have joint and several liability because they each uh, helped cause an indivisible harm to the point of uh, the starting point in unjust enrichment is you're liable for your profits and I don't profit from money that went to one of my co-conspirators. So there has to be something more than just an unjust enrichment theory. Partnership law clearly does it. Um, and maybe some of these other possibilities that you talked about, co-fiduciaries or close cooperation may do it as, as well. Uh, we'll see. But the starting point treats defendants' profits here uh, very differently from plaintiff's damages. So there were two Federal Trade Commission cases that the court had held waiting for Liu, and after Liu, they granted cert in both of them. And these are similar in some ways, more difficult, I think, for the government in uh, other ways. So um, the FTC Act authorizes the Trade Commission to obtain uh, a temporary restraining order, a preliminary injunction, or a permanent injunction whenever it has reason to believe that any person is violating or is about to violate any law that the FTC enforces. Um, so it doesn't say equitable relief. Uh, it says injunction, which may be narrower. Well, it is narrower. Um, 
FTC injunctions for a long time now in the lower courts have ordered violators to refund money wrongfully taken from consumers. The Ninth Circuit affirmed such an injunction, one of these two cases, AMG Capital against the Federal Trade Commission. And the other one, uh, Federal Trade Commission against uh, Credit Bureau Center, the Seventh Circuit said, injunction obviously does not mean monetary relief and doesn't include monetary relief. We know what an injunction is. An injunction is not disgorgement or accounting for profits. And the court took both cases and uh, agreed to resolve the split. I think the history here would be dispositive if the court knew it and if the court followed it, but there's a good chance the court doesn't know it and won't follow it if anyone tells them. Uh, the 19th century intellectual property cases, uh, which are heavily relied on in the U for the net profits and joint and several liability points, they granted accounting for profits as relief incidental to an injunction. Uh, the incidental relief didn't require separate authorization. And for a long time, it could not be awarded as an independent claim, uh, only incident to an injunction. Now, the courts would always enjoin continuing wrongdoing. And so the incidental award of profits became generally available against any kind of continuing and intentional uh, wrongdoer. Uh, well, the statute says injunction. Uh, to tell the court you can also award accounting for profits as relief incidental to an injunction uh, may run afoul of the court's increasingly frequent demand that Congress specify all the details of remedies in the statute. You know, the law used to be, before the conservative revolution on this issue, well, it used to be if Congress passes a statute, the courts assume that Congress meant for it to be enforced, and the, uh, and the courts will uh, apply the inventory of remedies that are available under common law and equity. Uh, more and more, the Supreme Court says, if you want a remedy, you have to get Congress to spell it out in the statute. And uh, whether relief incidental to an injunction will be, will run afoul of that, I think is, is, is a major issue in these two FTC cases. Um, plenty of precedent in the Supreme Court for accounting for profits as relief incidental to an injunction. Um, they may not know that and they may not follow it even if they do. Um, so the FTC is not even relying on, so far in the cert papers, we haven't, don't have the merits brief yet, FTC is not relying on uh, judicial ability to award relief incidental to an injunction. The FTC just says an, in, an injunction can order a defendant to do things and one of the things it can order the defendant to do is to pay money. Uh, so the injunction orders the defendant to um, to uh, disgorge its profits uh, or account for its profits and refund that money paid into the government. Um, <clears throat> we, in general, courts have done that for an identified fund. Uh, if we can still find the very proceeds of the fraud in the defendant's hands, we'll order the defendant to turn those over to the court or to the plaintiff. Um, but we do not, in general, order by injunction uh, defendants to pay money out of the defendant's general assets because an injunction to pay money enforceable by the contempt power winds up looking like imprisonment for debt. Uh, we order the defendant to pay. The defendant says, I can't pay. I don't have enough money anymore. Um, the plaintiff files uh, a contempt proceeding and the court sends the defendant to jail until he pays or the court tries to go through the budget and figure out whether he really can pay or can't pay. Uh, we encounter all the, we take all those difficulties up for child support, but we don't take it up for uh, other kinds of debt. Uh, the government just gets special treatment. Um, but it looks like that's going to be the line of argument for the FTC and the Supreme Court, that we can get an injunction that orders the defendant to pay money. One other interesting wrinkle here is the Trump administration may be refusing to support the FTC. It has so far not prevented the FTC from litigating on its own behalf, uh, but the Solicitor General did not oppose AMG's cert petition. It filed a very short op cert that just said, hold this case for Liu. Uh, and the FTC's petition and credit bureau is signed only by counsel for the FTC. It is not signed by the Solicitor General or by anyone at the Department of Justice. <clears throat> so, um, so next year's news will be whether a statute that authorizes an injunction can also support uh, an accounting for profits. Um, 
Caprice, Andrew, any other thoughts on those two cases? Well, if I can uh, offer one idea, D Doug, I um, am less familiar with these cases than you are. In fact, I didn't know the thing about them until you mentioned them the other day. I did read the uh, circuit court opinions in the two uh, that are going to be considered. Uh, it seems to me if you'd sort of take a step back uh, so that we're seeing the forest, not the trees, maybe the most striking thing about these cases and the reason we sh should be talking about them today, along with uh, Liu and Kokash, is the way that um, it's true, these FTC cases do not involve any sale of securities. So, okay, it's not a question of the 34 Act, but uh, they sure uh, involve fraudulent misrepresentations causing consumers to send in a lot of money to bad guys. And the very basic instinct that suggests if we're going to try to, if we're now running the FTC as a consumer protection operation, which in part, in large part now they are, uh, why would we stop with an injunction if we couldn't, uh, you will, you could maybe help them <laughs> frame their argument, but if we couldn't also offer them some ancillary relief in the form of, uh, they can call it disgorgement if they want to. It was also impressive to me that until the Seventh Circuit opinion two years ago, when uh, a you know majority turned coat on this question, apparently every circuit that had said anything on the question had agreed that uh, this was part of the FTC remedial arsenal. I would have said they agreed that because it seemed so common sense, the same way it did to the people in SEC versus Texas Gulf Sulphur. And so maybe, you know, with the sort of head of steam that they get from the Liu case, some of this will carry over to help the SEC. They can say this is equitable. Yeah, and, and I would add that I'm I'm also somewhat empathetic to what the FTC is trying to accomplish with the remedy. And if if I remember correctly, uh, in distinction from the SEC, I think the FTC does try to get the um, disgorged money or the the profits money to the victims of the fraud. So I think um, maybe they'll be able to sort of fit into. Now, of course, they're under a different statute, and they're not. These are not SEC cases. These are FTC cases. But um, you know what types of legal arguments they should make in addition to that. That it's the you know under under the injunction power. Maybe maybe your points well taken there. Uh, but I think that they're at least on to something that, as as Andrew said, sort of makes some common sense why some courts have have allowed that up to this point. And it's interesting that the administration might not uh, join in those arguments. I mean. Uh, that's probably fairly <laughs> to be expected here uh, that they wouldn't, but I think uh, hopefully the FTC will make a full-throated argument as to why it makes sense for them to be able to do it, both as a matter of the statutory, which I agree with you, the court increasingly seems to want the statute to be more explicit, uh, but that they'll also uh, add add sort of the traditional court powers. And these, these two sets of cases are entirely parallel except for the wording of the statute the, the securities cases and the federal trade commission cases both involve fraud they both involve uh, pretty egregious flagrant fraud they both involve a lot of money uh they both involve the question of how do you measure profits um there are lower court cases uh in ftc cases awarding gross receipts and not merely net profits uh supreme court hasn't gotten to those yet um, so all of that is parallel, uh, but the statutes are worded differently and the Supreme Court is increasingly focused on the text of the statute and, and on requiring Congress to specify the remedies. Uh, one other interesting thing going on here about the difference between damages and defendants' profits, uh, very often the reason the plaintiff wants uh, defendants' profits is that uh, for whatever reason, his profits are greater than the plaintiff's damages. Um, here, that's probably not true. The, the, the victims in these cases, both the securities fraud and the consumer fraud, the victims lost all the money they sent in. Only some of that turns out to be defendants' net profits because part of it got spent trying to run the business. Um, so the profits remedy is actually smaller. Uh, 
but the profit's remedy is much easier to prove. The government has trouble finding all the victims and proving up their individual damages is laborious and difficult. Uh, focusing just on the defendant and proving its profits uh, is attractive in part because it's a lot, a lot easier. Um, we also had a profits case this term in a private cause of action with a private plaintiff suing. Uh, Caprice, can you tell us about that one? Absolutely. So again, very interesting to me that the court is, is, is accepting cert, granting cert on a number of these cases, the ones we're talking about for the future, like the FTC cases. And just this year, it decided a case in a April 23rd, uh, 2020, that was Romag uh, fasteners versus fossil. And so the, the underlying claims uh, involve trademark, so under, under the Lanham Act, and the uh, allegations included that basically that Fossil had um, infringed on the trademark in addition to other claims of dilution, uh, but that had basically used the trademark um, fasteners from, from Romag. And, and there were some agreements between the two, between Fossil and Romag, but ultimately uh, Romag claimed that, that it was an infringing worthy offense uh, or, or uh, against the statute and, and the jury found um, that Fossil had in fact infringed. And, and so all this becomes relevant because the jury awarded uh, uh, trademark damages or what they call trademark damages, we wouldn't call um, profits uh, damages, but they basically included two theories. And one was that there would be um, a $90,000 in profits to prevent unjust enrichment and 6.7 million in profits to deter future trademark infringement. Uh, so lots of interesting questions coming out of the case, uh, but just, you know, in the limited time we have together, I'll, I'll um, boil it down to, to you know, this is another opportunity for the court to think about the, the phrasing that it's using and how to clarify this, this connective tissue to unjust enrichment and to the principles of equity. And, and again, as I mentioned before, uh, the court often isn't very clear on what it means by those uh, principles of equity. In this particular case, it was a nine to zero opinion and Justice Gorsuch authored the majority opinion. So as you can imagine, uh, his approach was very textualist. Uh, and there are two concurrences, one by Alito, uh, which had a couple of justices joining it, and, and one by Justice Sotomayor. But in the majority opinion, the big issue was whether or not the Lanham Act requires willfulness to yield, to get to a, a profits or what's called a disgorgement remedy here. And ultimately, under that textual analysis that Justice Gorsuch and the majority engaged uh, or utilized, interpreted the statute. They looked closely to the statute and said, you know, we're not going to conjure up uh, this, this willfulness requirement if it's not explicit in the statute. And so they, uh, the court held that the statute did not include or, or require this willfulness to get to the type of profit remedies that were at issue. And so the, the thing that's problematic about that, regardless of, you know, what method of interpretation you want to use. Uh, the court also talked about the Congress sure, surely didn't intend to make it a requirement. But uh, again, regardless of interpretive constitutional, or not constitutional, but, but method types of uh, textual interpretation, like in other constitutional cases, um, here, the court um, does this, and it does it despite the fact that there's the entire restatement third of restitution and unjust enrichment that is loaded with the the foundation for any profits-based restitution remedy uh, that it would require conscious wrongdoing. Uh, there is a discussion of defaulting fiduciaries, but every every other example, there's the uh, conscious wrongdoing as a part of it, and so there would be a, a willfulness or some type of intent analysis. In the Romag case, uh, the Romag actually said it, it agreed that it was not willful behavior and instead only alleged callous disregard on the part of Fossil. Uh, but again, what the Supreme Court's determination ultimately means is you can still go for a, a profits type remedy under the Lanham Act uh, without having to prove a willfulness component. But the majority did state, uh, and along with the concurrences as well, that that the intent could be a relevant consideration. And the um, Alito concurrence says it needs to be a, a very a highly important consideration. And the Sotomayor concurrence, again, concurrence, not a dissent, says that, that you know, awarding a, a profit type award 
without the willfulness and, and purely based on a good faith infringement seems to be not consonant with, and that's what she uh, says for it, not consonant with the principles of equity or reflected in the cases that the majority cites. And so, you know, I find it to be interesting that it's a nine to zero opinion. And again, I think that's largely based on that it's, it became a statutory interpretation case, as opposed to what would be more befitting the principles of equity and the principles of unjust enrichment present in the uh, American Law Institute's restatement third of restitution, which I think would want. Uh, there is no uh, profits remedy without keying it to conscious wrongdoing. And here the statute said principles of equity. Exactly. Exactly. No. You know, and I should have probably uh, included the the reading of, of the statutory language, um, which did say that the for you know could have different types of, of trademark infringements uh, or willful violations, but that they uh, shall the plaintiff shall be entitled to subject to the principles of equity to recover the defendant's profits uh, and any damages sustained by plaintiff and cost of the action. So right in the statute, it says the principles of equity. And so that fits right in with uh, what the court's already been doing in the case and then adds to it here. It's coming from the statutory language. So that, that would have been the perfect opportunity to say that equity is already embedded in all of the limits and doctrines that are required, including that you would want to have some type of conscious uh, conscious wrongdoing. Now we can debate which which words, uh, you know, willfulness or or as the court did in Kansas versus Nebraska, sort of uh, you know conscious disregard. That there are other ways of perhaps stating it, <clears throat> but again, some type of some type of willfulness, I think, would have made sense and it would have already fit within the statute, but not according to nine on the court. So. Uh, according to the court, looking at a strict textualist, they don't see anything imbued in that principles of equity that would include a requirement for conscious wrongdoing. And, you know, one, one recurring issue in these cases is too many lawyers, too many courts think about these issues cause of action by cause of action. Uh, and, and the court viewed this as a trademark case and they debated what the rule had been in trademark cases, but they, but they said whatever the rule was, we don't assume Congress was thinking about a narrow trademark rule when it said principles of equity. Uh, and they seemed oblivious to the fact that there's a much broader principle of equity that cuts across all kinds of causes of action uh, that says you don't get to defend its profits unless he was a fiduciary or unless uh, he was consciously or intentionally engaging in the wrongdoing. Uh, Andrew, do you have anything to add on Romac? All of everything we've said is, you know, legitimately uh, raised by the interesting questions surrounding this case, um, this uh, SEC versus Liu case, especially as somebody who is sometimes, I have to admit it, skeptical of the role of academics who offer amicus briefs to the two give the benefit of their insights when nobody has asked them. Uh, this very interesting case is, and I think extremely helpful decision. I think that putting Kokesh and Liu side by side, it is really moving the law in this area, a hard shove in the right direction back to making some sense. And if you read, Justice Sotomayor's opinion, and you read the uh, law professor's amicus brief, which I think I know was largely written by Doug Laycock. Uh, this is Doug's service uh, to the law in this area, and I, I haven't had a chance to tell him that face to face, but uh, I'm sure Caprice agrees with me. Uh, it's very, very impressive. So I think we're grateful. Well, you're very welcome. You may be I'm exaggerating. Sorry. I'm in agreement, <laughs> 100%. So we've talked some about the 19th century cases that uh, were precedent for Liu, but of course, especially at this court, we also have arguments about what the rules were in 1789 when the judicial system was created. Um, and Andrew, you've been thinking about that problem a bit. Can you fill us in on it? I do find this very interesting, and it's I think it's one of the, uh, not the least of the interesting features of this Liu opinion. Uh, for people who don't have it fresh in their minds, the issue is the one 
that was uh, raised or at least uh, imposed as a barrier by Justice Scalia in the case known as Grupo Mexicano, the plaintiffs wanted an injunction temporarily freezing the assets of the defendants in the style that in most courts of the English speaking world is referred to as a Mareva injunction and is very familiar. And I think it's fair to say most people thought was a appropriate 20th century equity development. The Supreme Court in that case said that uh, unless it was, unless a remedy was characteristic of the ordinary chancery practice as it existed in 1789, it was not within the federal court's jurisdiction and it was beyond their power to grant. Uh, so the question would be, <laughs> if you are trying to recover profits from somebody who has defrauded you, uh, was that something you could have done in the ordinary chancery practice of 1789? I am aware of only one case in which this argument was made by a securities defendant and taken seriously. And it is, a, I think, very interesting uh, decision by Judge Cabranes. It is called SEC versus Kavanaugh, and it was about 2005. Mr. Kavanaugh tried to get out of his disgorgement liability on the basis that you couldn't have disgorgement in the English Chancery in 1789. Uh, the judge, and I think his very industrious uh, law clerks, make a kind of heroic effort to show that, um, yes, it was commonplace. And Frankly, uh, I think they succeed in showing that you could have this remedy against fiduciaries. I do not think they managed to show that you could have it against uh, non-fiduciary wrongdoers. Doug, in the Liu context, Doug and uh, his colleagues point to the patent infringement cases in the 19th century with uh, injunction plus associated accounting as the source of the, um, of the you know, whatever we want to call it, this form of restitution um, for present purposes. I, I'm sure they're right about that. That doesn't really answer the question. So the, the, that, that makes it relevant. Well, how seriously do we take Grupo Mexicano as a limitation? on disgorgement in the United States these days, assuming that our defendants are not fiduciaries. They're not officers and directors of anything. They're just crooks. Uh, this is why I think it is so interesting that in the SEC versus Liu, unless I somehow missed it, there is no reference to this Grupo Mexicano problem in the majority opinion, it has totally dropped off the table and only shows up in the dissenting opinion of Justice Thomas, um, where he's, I mean, he's, he has unfortunately inherited uh, uh, being a bonnet about um, disgorgement not being a real thing as opposed to what the three of us all agree, which is uh, that it's just a perhaps unfortunate new name for an old thing. Uh, but the fact that it's not even mentioned by the majority and uh, relegated to, um, you know, there's protest uh, in the dissenting opinion makes me think that the current Supreme Court is perhaps not as interested in this most of us would agree, very artificial limitation on equitable remedies in 21st century American law. Well, and they, they, they shouldn't be interested. The common law has evolved since 1789. Equity has evolved since 1789. Um, there weren't many structural injunctions in 1789. Um, 
When we did the brief in Liu, we frankly didn't think about group email condom, and we didn't try to trace the patent cases back to 1789. Um, uh, uh, Justice Story took them for granted in his treatise in the 1830s. I think they've been around for a while. Maybe we could have found them in 1789, or maybe not. Sounds like uh, Judge Cabranes didn't find them when, when he went looking. Um, or maybe he thought the fiduciary cases were enough and didn't think about the distinction between fiduciary defendants and, and other defendants. Um, it would be good if uh, Grupo Mexicano just kind of faded into the past. Uh, one of the big transitional cases in U.S. law, apart from the patent cases uh, Andrew mentioned briefly early on, Newton versus Porter in the New York Court of Appeals in 1877 or so, um, that was an outright theft. Uh, thieves broke into a house and stole bearer bonds. Uh, and the New York court said, well, it would be absurd if the victim of a theft had fewer rights than the victim of a trustee or fiduciary. I don't know if it was absurd or not, but, um, but it certainly made sense that you ought to be able to have a full and complete uh, remedy against these people. So, um, so the remedy for uh, the defendant's profits has been around for a very long time. Whether it's been around since 1789, I guess we don't really know. None of the three of us have have done that, done that research. Um, well, there's a run of these cases in the Supreme Court. There are lots of cases um, in, in the lower courts. Um, one of my friends at Seton Hall Law School says the most common form of legal malpractice is to overlook the restitution claim. Um, I suspect it's really to blow the statute of limitations, but overlooking the restitution claim can't be far behind. There's a lot of law here. Uh, it actually has rules. It is not just vague and mushy. Uh, you can find those rules in Andrew's uh, restatement, and you can find some of them in opinions like uh, Liu versus the uh, versus the SEC. Um, so I hope you found this helpful, and we've gone on too long. We're going to sign off now. Thank you for tuning in to Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn more about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton and digital editing by Sarah Ferrero. Podcast episodes are moderated by Jennifer Marinigo and I'm Sean Kellum.